Today I am here with a really, really cool instrument. And as you can tell, it's not a piano, but it's actually a harpsichord. Now, many of my uh, followers on my YouTube channel really love it when I do videos on harpsichords, and some of them have been asking for a very long time for me to do videos on these awesome instruments. But the problem is they're just very difficult to come by. This is actually the second one that I've been able to find when my YouTube channel has been active. And as you can see here, it is made by Sabathil and Sun. I find it interesting that it says Sun instead of Sons, but apparently Mr. Sabathil only had one son who was working with him in this business. Now, what makes this uh, harpsichord rather interesting is not only is it a harpsichord, which is kind of interesting, it is. it was made in 1970 and it was actually made in Canada of all places. And if we come here and look at this decal on the inside, we can see that it says made in Canada. It has German, it has been applied for German and US and Canadian patents, as well as you can see that it was made in 1970. And I believe that opus number means that this is the 1601st uh, harpsichord that Sabbath Hill and Son have made. They even have an address that are on the um, on the decal that says fine historical keyboard instruments. So based on that logo right there, I'd imagine that not only do they make harpsichords, but they probably also make clavichords, pianofortes, maybe other unusual instruments like virginals or something like that. As you can see, it's a very, very well-made uh, harpsichord. And what makes it kind of interesting is traditionally harpsichords did not have any kind of metal reinforcing the inside. They were only wood. But since this was made in 1970 and it's a more modern version of the harpsichord, we actually have a simple metal frame that runs around the rim of the harpsichord, which again is not a traditional feature, but I think it's a very awesome feature because traditionally harpsichords have been known to be very, very unstable and constantly require tuning because there's no metal frame to hold everything in place and make it more stable. Stable. But since we have a very, very simple metal frame here, the instrument is actually in tune, and I'm imagining it probably stays in tune for a very long time, quite similar to a piano. Maybe not quite as stable as a piano, but it is going to be more stable than a traditional harpsichord. Now, what's kind of interesting about the inside here as well is you would notice we have two bridges and we also have tuning pins down here. And what's kind of interesting is the tuning pins are a whole lot smaller than your traditional um, tuning hammer. At the end, I will show you the tuning hammer that would come with this instrument if you buy it to allow you to tune the instrument. And also what's kind of funny is that the string, it appears, I can't take this piece of wood off, so I can't see what's happening at the other end of the string, but it appears that two strings are applied, maybe these are just hitch pins. Are these hitch pins? Okay, I'm wrong, these are not the tuning pins. These are the hitch pins like you normally find on a piano. I thought they were square. The tuning pins would be underneath of this piece of wood, which does not appear to come off, but I'm sure that it does. Uh, you can probably turn these, it, they feel like they can turn, and this piece of wood would somehow come off, and then you can access not only the plectrums for repair and maintenance, but also the tuning pins so that you can tune the instrument. I. Um, I stand corrected on the fact that these are the tuning pins. These are, in fact, the uh, hitch pins like you normally have on a piano. But from where I was sitting, they looked kind of like they were square. So we have two different strings for each note, kind of like we have on a piano. On a piano, we have three different strings for each note. But on a harpsichord, in this case, we have two. And there's kind of an interesting feature that these strings can do, which I will demonstrate in a little bit here. But first, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the aesthetic of the instrument. We have a very simple but very functional music desk right here. It's very small. You can just put a little book up there. And there's also a little wooden lip here to catch your sheet music from slipping off the edge, which is a very nice touch. One thing that makes harpsichords a lot different from pianos, not only in the way they sound, the way they function, and the way they look, is the design of the lid, which as you can see is a lot simpler than on a piano lid, and it also closes up in a much different way. This is the lid prop, it's very small and thin. This closes, and then unlike a piano, where this would fold over and then that would close up the top, and then you have a separate piece for the fallboard, this is actually traditionally all one piece. As you can see, it opens up like this, then opens up like that, and in this case, it kind of slants down. And that is what the harpsichord looks like when it's all closed up. It's very beautiful, and I like how they did a nice slant here. Sometimes harpsichords are just straight in front. But this one here actually has a nice, elegant little slant there, and it looks really cool. So but now you're probably wondering, what does this sound like? I love harpsichords. They're awesome. So I'm going to demonstrate a uh, Bach piece. It was a hymn that was reharmonized by Bach, and I'm going to play that on this harpsichord. It's rather time appropriate. And let me open up this lid, actually, to let all of the sound escape from the instrument. Let me do that right there. So I am going to demonstrate the sound of this instrument. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more about those interesting features with the string that I mentioned earlier.
As you can hear, the harpsichord has a much, much different sound than a piano, which of course, if you're familiar with a harpsichord, you already knew that. And uh, But that's kind of what the magic of the harpsichord, it's such a radically different instrument than really anything else we have, and uh, it's such a really interesting and awesome, awesome instrument. So now I'm going to play a little bit more on it in a bit, but I also want to talk a little bit more about some interesting features that this instrument has. And one of them that you're probably noticing here is the keys. If we come in here and take a look at the keys, you'll notice that they're actually made of wood. This appears to be real rosewood on top. And then these, uh, I don't know what type of wood they are, but they are made of real wood. The grain pattern is unique in each key, and they actually feel like real wood as well. So, but you're, the big thing here is not the fact that they're made of wood, but the fact that the colors are inverted. Normally these are the black keys and these are the white keys, as you can see here on a more traditional piano. These are the white keys, these are the black keys, but in fact on this they're inverted. And you're probably wondering why is that? And I've been told, and I've, it's actually been proven to me, and I've, I've been put in a dark room with an instrument like this, and the interesting thing about this is that in low light conditions, the inverted colors like this, where the white keys are the black keys and the black keys are the white keys, the inverted colors make it much easier to see and identify the different keys, which might sound strange, but if you have an instrument like this with inverted keys, turn off the lights and then go to try to play it compared to a normal piano with the inverted colors. And while you can do it on both of them, it appears to be easier to do on an instrument with inverted keys. Now, if you're observant, you've probably noticed these little knobs here on the front of the instrument. That's not a fallboard, as I showed you earlier, but you will have noticed these little knobs. And essentially what these are, are like organ stops. You can push them in and pull them out. I did that backwards. I pulled it in, pulled it out and pushed it in, but you get the idea. You can move them, and what these do is they actually shift the plectrums inside of the instrument. If I was able to open up this top, I'd show you that. But essentially what that does is it unlocks that second row of keys. So this one here, when I play it when it's in, it's only the uh, the eight foot, the, they're calling it an eight foot um, set of strings. And then when you pull it out, it activates the quote unquote, the four foot stop, the higher rank of strings at the same time as the, the uh, quote unquote, the eight foot. Again, this instrument is only about four feet long, so it's not really an eight foot stop. But that's what we're calling it because it's kind of relatable to an organ. In an organ, we have different ranks of stops based on the length of the longest pipe, 16 feet, eight feet, four feet, two feet, one foot, et cetera, like that. And so that's kind of how you classify the pitch of the instrument. So the eight foot stop is lower, is an octave lower than a four foot stop. And that's what's going on here. We have the quote unquote eight foot stop. And then we have the higher pitch stop. Now this instrument needs a little bit of adjustment. And uh, so that note there, I'm sure that if I go inside, sometimes the plectrums on these instruments need to be replaced. And that's probably all that's going on with that note. Everything else around this instrument works. The harpsichord is, again, a lot different from a piano. The action parts on a piano are almost always reliable. Breaking a hammer shank or something like that is very difficult to do. But on a harpsichord, it's a much different design. And it's, again, a lot more dainty, as you can see. The frame of this harpsichord is a lot smaller and just lighter weight. I could probably pick up the whole thing on my back and walk out the door with it if I wanted to um, than a piano is. And so therefore, the action parts do need a bit of replacing every now and then. But that is essentially what these knobs here do. They activate and deactivate the second rank of strings. I have both of them shut off at the moment. That's the main one, and then this here is the higher pitch one. I actually had that wrong. This controls the lower rank of strings. Pushing them in like that, deactivates them, pulling it out, activates them, and then this one here pulls in the higher rank of strings. You would think it would be the other way around, that this one would control the lower set because it's on the lower end, and this is the higher end, and it controls the higher strings. But it's the other way around, but that's what they do. Now this little lever here actually activates a set of mutes, and I believe that that's classified as a different sound. On the little card for the instrument, it said it had three sounds, the eight foot, the four foot, and the lute sound. And that is what this lever does. There are three positions. There's the right position. You can kind of set it in the middle, and then you can also have it in the left position. And what that does is it's a mute. Now let me figure out which set of strings is being muted. It's not the lower set, it's the higher set. As you can hear, when you move this over, a little set of felts comes over and it touches the strings and it's actually touching one set of string before the other one. Because if you look top down on the instrument, you'll see that on one set of strings, they're actually slightly offset. And even though they're completely vertical, one of them is slightly over to the left than the other. So that's why when you slide this little lever over, it's proportional. And depending on how far over you set it, it's either muting one set of strings or the other. So with this setting, it's muting the upper or the higher pitched set of strings. And in this position, it's muting the lower set. And I don't know if it's also muting the upper set. It does not. So this set mutes the upper. This position mutes the lower position. 
and then in the middle, uh, the mutes are deactivated and they do not hit any of the strings. So that all of them are ringing out at once. So now I think I will play another piece on this instrument for you. I like to play the Davy Jones theme from Pirates of the Caribbean on various instruments like organs and harpsichords because it actually fits pretty well. So that's what I'm going to do on this organ. And I'm also going to, I mean, I called it an organ. Oh my gosh, it's a harpsichord. I was thinking about organs because they're awesome. And I said organ on mistake by instead of calling it a harpsichord. So I'm going to play that piece on this harpsichord, not an organ. And I'll also use the little stop here to demonstrate how you'd use that in music. So I hope you enjoyed that little performance there of Davy Jones' theme on this awesome harpsichord. Uh, it's a really cool instrument, and as I showed you, that is how you would use this little stop here to get a volume difference as well as a tone difference out of the instrument. Now, if you're curious how the action feels on this instrument compared to a piano, well, it's a lot different. First of all, the keys are a little bit shorter, which I don't really think affects the way it plays so much because it's such a radically different instrument. But as you can see here, compared to a inch, uh, keyboard, which we have over here, which has the same size keys as a piano, the black keys are considerably longer and the white keys are very long compared to a harpsichord. This is how approximately how long the white keys are on this instrument. And if I bring them over, again, my fingers probably moves. But you can see there that the white keys on the piano are a little bit longer than they are on this harpsichord. And the action itself feels a lot different, because instead of having a bunch of complicated mechanisms that has a hammer strike a string, we instead have a very simple mechanism that has a little plectrum pluck a string. And so you essentially, the key will go down, and then all of a sudden it will bump down, and the plectrum will bump up and it will pluck the string, and then that is what you have going on. So it has a lot different feel. It's a very kind of a plucky feel, even though you're pushing down on the keys. It doesn't have that smooth proportional feel of a piano, which of course is how the harpsichord is supposed to be. Now, as you heard, I played, first of all, Bach, and then I also played a more contemporary piece, but it's kind of got that sort of a classical sort of feel to it, which was the David Jones theme. But you can also play modern music, such as uh, Stevie Wonder's Superstition. <laughs> So of course, there's nothing stopping you from playing something awesome like blues or rock on an instrument like this, which is something that nobody has ever done. And I'm wondering if you could actually properly incorporate a harpsichord into music like that. It actually sounds really good for jazz chords, certain ones especially. It has a really interesting sound for a chord like that. And again, I don't think anyone has ever put harpsichord into music like that. So maybe someday I'll experiment and see if it can be done. So if that sounds interesting to you, uh, you might want to think about subscribing. I might end up doing that sometime in the future. But if, you, if I don't end up doing that, I still have lots of videos on my channel of I have another video of a harpsichord on there, and I might have more coming out in the future. And if that sounds cool to you, you might want to think about subscribing. I also have videos on pianos and actual organs. Not I called this an organ for some reason. But I also have or videos on actual organs on my channel and all kinds of other cool stuff. So if that sounds interesting to you, you might want to go check it out. And if you want to subscribe, thank you very much, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye. So this is a box that comes with the harpsichord if you were to purchase it. And there's a couple interesting things in here. I think there's some extra stuff as well, like this wooden chunk that doesn't actually match the finish of the harpsichord, but that is in there and it might have something to do with the harpsichord. This might be like a little action piece. And we also have some replacement strings if one were to break. But there's a couple interesting things in here as well. First, of, The first one that I wanted to mention is the tuning hammer. Now this is the tuning hammer that you would use on this harpsichord. And it's similar to a piano tuning hammer, but it's a lot smaller. The fitting here at the end is uh, smaller, but a 
a similar design as a piano hammer would be. And like I said, the tuning pins are most likely under this piece of wood. So if the instrument goes out of tune, which it is slightly, the unison's a little bit out, but that's kind of the nature of a harpsichord. If you wanted to perfect that, it's very easy to come in there, put the tuning pin inside of this fitting, and then turn it so the unisons are in line. So if you were to purchase this instrument, it would come with this, which is very cool. But another thing that's very cool is inside of this little box that I assume comes with the harpsichord is a uh, manual for the harpsichord as well as a card for, I assume, a dealer, since as I said, this instrument was made in Canada, but this guy is in Bristol, Virginia. It says Sabbath Hill Harpsichords and Clavichords. I was right, Sabbath Hill does also make clavichords. There is some stuff on the back. First row of pins is four foot, second uh, row of pins is eight foot. Tune all of eight foot register first. So there's tuning hints on the back of that card as well. And so that is a card for, I assume, a dealer. There's also an instruction manual here that uh, came with the harpsichord when it was originally bought. As you can see, it's a little bit old because this instrument was made in 1970, and I imagine this is original. We have the action. So this is demonstrating how the action on the harpsichord works. We have plectrums that come up and pluck it, and then we also have um, how to regulate it and how to make it work better. We have tuning hints as well as tuning sequence for all models. So these are the list of models that Sabbath Hill has made at some point. We have a clavichord dolce, a virginal amoroso, harpsichords cantabile, Maiosta, Maist, Maistoso 2, Maistoso 3, uh, those might be harpsichords, Concerto 1 and a Concerto 2 and all Bach models. So these are probably different variations on harpsichords. This is a virginal, as I uh, predicted, and we also have a clavichord. No piano forte on the list, but that's okay. These are all very cool instruments. Maybe someday I will find some more of them. Nothing on the back. So that's just something that came with a harpsichord that I thought you guys might find interesting. And one thing I forgot to mention in the rest of the video is that if you're curious as to where I found this instrument, it sounds like there's more strings in here. If you're curious as to where I found this instrument, I'll put the information for the store down in the description of this video. So if you want to come play this awesome instrument for yourself and see some of the other cool things they have, like a really awesome church organ in that corner, you can come do that. And like I said, the information for the store will be in the description of the video. So you can drop by and check it out.